church. So we had the overview last week, and now we're just looking at verses 1 through 3, kind of setting the scene, if you will. Uh, these opening verses of Paul's letter to Philemon, although brief, they do offer some profound theological insights. This letter, while personal in nature, it reveals much about the Apostle Paul's understanding of Christian community, leadership, and partnership in the gospel. So looking at Philemon 1, verses 1 through 3, yeah, I know it's only one chapter, but that's how we always say it, Philemon chapter 1. But verses 1 through 3, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to to Apia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at first glance, it might seem like these opening verses are a simple greeting. But on closer inspection, they offer some uh, theological and what we call pastoral dimensions. Now, pastoral simply means shepherding or shepherd uh, dimension. So just looking at these a little bit more in detail, the beginning of verse 1 there, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So he begins this letter by identifying himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And that designation is actually somewhat striking because in other epistles, he often refers to himself as an apostle. Like Romans 1 and verse 1, or 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 1, for example. He might call himself just Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or Paul, an apostle called out of season, because we know he was called on the road to Damascus there by Christ, and, and so he's out of season from when the others were called. Uh, but here he emphasizes his imprisonment, and underscoring the cost of his ministry and the depths of his commitment to Christ. Now, the Greek word here used for prisoner is desmios, and it means one who is bound. One who is bound. Now, uh, that's not only a physical condition, uh, but is that he's likely under house arrest in Rome. You might jot down Acts 28 and verse 16. But it also serves as a metaphor for his total submission to Christ. Galatians 2 and verse 20, for example, he says, The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? So it serves as not just a, a physical condition, but his total submission is in Christ. Paul is bound not primarily by Roman chains, but by his allegiance to Jesus. And this idea of being bound to God, it resonates with Old Testament imagery. Because in Exodus, the concept of servitude is addressed, but it's within the context of covenant loyalty. For example, when the Israelites were freed from Egyptian bondage, they were reminded that they were now to serve Yahweh. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. So Paul, he reflects this same, what we term, covenantal language. And he reflects this understanding that even in his physical imprisonment, he remains spiritually tethered to the will of Christ. So he's not just bound to Christ when he's a free man and able to go wherever he wants to go. But even there, under house arrest in Rome, he is still bound to Christ. He, he still must maintain a loyalty to Christ and to Christ's gospel. And he says, and Timothy, our brother, there in the latter portion of verse 1. So he includes Timothy, his young protege, as a co-sender of the letter. Now, if you read Philemon closely, you can see where there's a little bit of a shift because it speaks in particular that I'm like Paul, the aged. So there's a part in there that's Timothy's words, but most of it being Paul's. But he includes Timothy, his young protege, as Paul would refer to him, his son in the faith, as a co-sender. Now, while Timothy's role in this specific letter is pretty minimal, uh, his presence reinforces the communal nature of Paul's ministry. It's uh, the term Adelphos there, translated as brother. Brother. 
right? It's significant. See, in the New Testament, it emphasizes the familial bond that all believers have in Christ. We refer to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's a relationship that transcends, or at least it should, transcend all earthly relationship and it reflects our kinship uh, through the gospel there Galatians 3 and verse uh, 28 that we are all bound together by something greater than flesh and blood like we have with our earthly brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles that we don't talk about and all of that right we there's something closer there and by referring to timothy as our brother he's reminding philemon and the recipients of the letter of their shared identity as members of god's household paul's saying he's not just my brother but he's your brother as well and that should be a reminder for us that we all understand that each congregation is autonomous, that it is governed locally by the elders or however it's kind of set up there. Maybe it's men's meetings or what have you. And each congregation is autonomous. But whether they're here in the DFW Metroplex or whether they're in Ukraine, they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So the communal bond that we share, it's not just locally, but it's universally. And so Paul's including that here. And he says to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker there in the latter portion of verse one, Philemon, he's addressed with two notable titles, a beloved brother and a fellow worker. Now, the phrase beloved brother, it's both affectionate and theological. Uh, the, the root there, it, it's, um, it actually stems from agape. And agape, we know, uh, is the highest form of love. There are several different types of love. There's, uh, you know, phileo and eros and uh, storge and what have you. But here, it stems from the highest form of love in the New Testament, often used to describe God's love uh, for people there in John 3 and verse 16. In Paul's use of the term, it signifies a deep Christian affection for Philemon, not just as an individual, but again, as one who is loved by God. There's a, there's a preacher that I, I listen to. I can't, I can't remember his name. He just comes on 770 AM, uh, and I'll, I'll listen to him. But he uses that word a lot when referring to the congregation. He's always calling them beloved. I thought about doing that one time here, but then I figured I'd get some pretty awkward looks maybe if I started calling people beloved. Like, what do you mean by that? You know? But there is, it's not just that he is a brother in Christ. He is one who is loved by God. And that term fellow worker, I mean, that emphasized Philemon's active participation in the gospel. It's not just that he is a brother in Christ, it's that he is a brother who works. He is a brother who is actively involved in moving the gospel forward. And that designation, it's frequently used by Paul to describe those who labor alongside him in the ministry. Philemon's role in the early church, it wasn't passive. Now, we don't know much about him. But just from that, him being a beloved brother, we know that Paul held him in high regard. Uh, we know that he was of a good reputation. And him being a fellow worker is that he wasn't just your every, average, everyday Christian. That he was involved. So even just a few words tell us a whole lot about the man. And he was deeply involved in the spread of the gospel, likely hosting a house church and contributing to the growth of the Christian community there in Colossae. Now, he also mentions there in verse 2, Aphia and Archippus. So in addition to Philemon, Paul addresses these two. Uh, Aphia, who he calls our sister, and Archippus referred to as a fellow soldier. Now, some people, they actually, actually suggest that Aphia might have been Philemon's wife. 
but there's no way to tell. Her relationship to Philemon is uncertain. But nevertheless, Paul references, uh, his reference to her as our sister reflects the, the nature of early Christian communities. And like I said, we, we continue that on today, referring to one as, as brother or, or sister. But women played a vital role in ministry and in church life. It is it, women have always played a vital role in the spreading of the gospel and the growth of the kingdom. And sad to say is that many times women don't get the recognition that they so rightly deserve. Now I say rightly, and I'm talking about, of course, recognition in man's eyes because God sees all and, and he will recognize all things. But apparently she was vital to that. Now, Archippus, on the other hand, he's called a fellow soldier. That military metaphor used by Paul, it's to describe those who endure hardship in fighting the spiritual battle alongside him. He doesn't call him fellow worker, you notice, like he does Philemon. He calls him a fellow soldier. So this is more than likely an individual who has suffered, uh, you know, being put in chains or being beaten or, or some type of, of retribution, if you will, on behalf of either the Jews or the Gentiles. Uh, but uh, Archippus is also mentioned in Colossians 4 and verse 17, where Paul exhorts him to fulfill his ministry. So there was a particular work that this individual was involved with, and in that he suffered. And that term soldier evokes imagery of the Old Testament as well, where God is often as uh, depicted as the uh, what's called the, the Yahweh Sabbath, the, the Lord of hosts, leading his people into battle. You might just jot down 1 Samuel 17 and, and verse 45 if you're taking notes. The Old Testament, it says, the Lord will fight for you, but you'll hold your peace. And elsewhere it says, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. So in the same way, Archippus is part of a spiritual battle contending for the faith and the advancement of the gospel. And he mentions the church in your house. Paul's mention of the church in your house reflects the early Christian practice of meeting in homes. You see, the early church didn't have dedicated buildings until around the third century. Uh, up until then, they met in people's homes. And you just look at some of those shorter epistles to the church that is in your house, greetings, because that's where they met. That's where they could meet and without a fear of persecution and what have you. It wouldn't be for another few hundred years that they would actually have, that Christians would actually have dedicated buildings. And sometimes we can, you know, I believe that that would probably be even the better route, if I'm being honest with you. And sometimes I feel that way when I look and see how focused Christians become on the building and how nice it is or, you know, how much it's fallen apart or whatever the case may be. Sometimes it might just be better if we just had a home. And I know people who even today, they have what are called house churches. And I've asked them, well, how does that work? And they'll sit there and they'll tell me, they'll say, well, we have elders. And how can you have elders? It's in your house. Okay, well, the elders, I mean, they see us as much as we see them, whether we're in a building or whether we're in our home. The building has nothing to do with it. And in fact, they have said that they are able to give so much more. Because, and this is the way they explained it to me. And I have no doubt that it's probably something similar in the first century when Christians were meeting. You have a home. The electric bill is already paid. The rent is already paid. The lawn is already taken care of. It's already insured. Everything is already taken care of because of the individuals who live there. So the contribution that is given is 100% given away. So each week, there might be a small house church or something in Oklahoma who's able to just give two or $3,000, everything that they have. And if there's a member of that small house church that needs help, they just hand them an envelope and they say, here you go, that's for you. 
And I have no doubt that it is, was like that or something similar in the first century. They were selling things and it says they had all things in common. And Paul's greeting the church there in, the, in, in their home. Believers might have gathered in the houses of wealthy people like Philemon. He was no doubt wealthy because he had slaves. I mean, that is one of the purposes of this letter. Had room to worship and to fellowship. And the practice of house churches, it's mentioned elsewhere. I'll just give you a couple of references. Romans 16 and verse 5. In 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 19. In the Old Testament, the idea of God dwelling among his people is seen in the tabernacle and later in the temple but with the coming of Christ the physical presence of God shifted from a single location to a gathered community of believers who are now the temple of the spirit first Corinthians 3 and verse 16 so the house church in Philemon's home represents a continuation of God's desire to dwell with his people not in a not in a building but within a community that's centered around Christ. Even God said, or Jesus rather said to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, there will come a time where you will not worship God in this mountain and you're not going to worship him in the temple either. And we see lastly, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ there in verse 3. Paul concludes his greeting with a familiar benediction, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That Greek term there for grace, it represents unmerited favor towards humanity. You may have heard it described as grace being God's riches at Christ's expense. It's a central theme in Paul's theology. Look at Ephesians, rather. I told you, potluck. Ephesians 2 and verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not just the absence of conflict, but the presence of wholeness and reconciliation with God. And so this dual blessing of grace and peace, again, comes from the Old Testament. I know there's people who they look at the Old Testament and they say, wow, that's an absolutely pointless collection of 39 books. But it stems from there, the concept of shalom. A comprehensive peace that signifies well-being and harmony and, and divine favor. And so by invoking this blessing, Paul prays that Philemon and his household would experience both the favor of God and his deep abiding love that comes through Christ. Now we haven't really even gotten to the meat of this book yet, and so I appreciate your patience. But in these opening verses of Philemon, Paul sets the tone for a letter that is deeply personal, yet richly theological. He establishes the communal nature of the Christian faith, reminding Philemon and the recipients of their shared identity in Christ. He highlights the centrality of grace and peace, gifts from God that define the Christian experience. And just these few verses, they serve as a reminder that the Christian life is one of partnership in the gospel, of love for one another and a deep commitment to the work of Christ, even in the midst of suffering and hardship. And that's what we have to remember. No man is an island in and of himself. We are in a partnership to propel the gospel forward. And we always need to be reminded of that. And in reflecting on Philemon, just these few verses, I pray that we're reminded of our own call to be fellow workers and fellow soldiers for the gospel, bound not by chains, but by our love for Christ. And I pray that as we go into the world this week, that we will remember our purpose, that we will remember that we are not just one, but we are part of something bigger. And that God is always present. And if there's anything that I can do to help, I, I'd be certainly glad to. If you need the prayers of the congregation, we will pray with you and for you under the throne of Almighty God, knowing that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. But if you in any way need something that you'd like to make known publicly, you can do so as we stand and as we sing.